Welcome to Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Monday, August 6, 2012. We begin with an update from the world of medicine, particularly immunology. Researchers from Newcastle University have discovered a new type of white blood cell with some important research applications. As you probably know, white blood cells are the main fighters in the immune system and T cells are probably the most well-known subtype. But this story is about dendritic cells, DCs for short, which are the white blood cells mainly responsible for initiating an immune response. Small, disease-associated molecules called antigens get expressed on the DCs, but most can only express from within themselves. However, an even smaller subset of DCs have an ability called cross-presenting, essentially expressing an antigen from an external source. It's these specific white blood cells which have just been identified in humans, which is important. Now these cells are extremely important because they're basically why vaccines work. Bacterial or viral fragments used in vaccines can't usually infect cells actively, meaning cross-presenting is the only way to impart immunity. So further research into how these cells work will help the development of vaccines. Of particular interest is vaccines that target cancer. Another interesting development was comparing dendritic cells from humans and mice, creating what the researchers called a Rosetta Stone of Immunity. By comparing gene expression from the cells of each species, they could identify similar patterns in the immune reaction, meaning the discovery of this cell type will also help researchers predict how humans would react based on tests using mice. Our next story is from the world of biotechnology. Scientists at both Penn State and Stanford have been studying microbes that produce methane with the goal of using them as a fuel source. Unsurprisingly, they are called methanogens and aren't bacteria but belong to a genetically distinct group of microbes called archaea. Back in 2009, it was discovered that one species of methanogen could essentially metabolize pure electricity to produce methane. This discovery was made by growing a biofilm on electrodes within a nutrient-rich environment. Around 80% efficiency was achieved converting electricity into methane, but only within biofilm. When the methanogen was isolated and grown separately, the efficiency dropped dramatically, suggesting that the microbial community is important to the health of the methanogen. Now some of you may think this is a bad idea from an environmental standpoint given methane is a greenhouse gas. On Brainstorm, we've discussed a similar process of methane production using chemical catalysts and like that, this biology-based process also absorbs carbon dioxide. The idea is that surplus power from wind, solar, or other environmentally friendly sources could be diverted to the bioreactors full of these microbes. Using this electricity and absorbing atmospheric CO2, they'd produce methane that would be stored carefully and used as fuel. This would be carbon neutral because, while burning methane releases CO2, it would be offset by the amount needed to create the methane. Plus, not all of the methane would be burned. It could become the basis for producing other materials that are generally petroleum-based. Most importantly, this process has several advantages of other alternative fuels like biofuel. One, it doesn't take up agricultural land, and two, there is already devices and infrastructure based around methane. Study will continue on these microbes with the hope of developing a safe and efficient source of fuel. Finally, we end with an update from the world of genetics. Scientists in Germany have been analyzing the genome of brain tumors from children as part of a project called PEDBRAIN. Something you may not know is that brain tumors are a leading cause of cancer mortalities in children. Even if current treatments are successful, they're very stressful for the patient, potentially causing damage to a still developing brain. The analysis showed a lot of variation between tumor samples, but some patterns definitely emerged. For example, of the cancer type studied, a sizable number had double the number of chromosomes, especially among the most aggressive tumors. It's not clear whether the extra chromosomes are caused by or a cause of the cancer. But either way, it's a potential treatment target. You may have noticed that we haven't yet used the term mutations. That's because the changes were both genetic and epigenetic. Another interesting pattern was the alterations to the tumor's genome appeared to increase with the age of the person they were from. Although what this correlation implies isn't well understood, as the scientists suspect, the foundation for this cancer happens as early as embryonic development. 
A completely new discovery was finding fusion genes in this type of cancer, which is when a mutation causes cancer-promoting genes to fuse together. This is another promising drug target, and there's been success with other types of cancer. Finding all these patterns of mutations has already given the scientists new insight into brain cancer and will hopefully help the development of new drugs with few side effects. In the meantime, the study of pediatric brain cancer will continue, comparing the tumor genome to that of healthy tissue. The plan is to analyze 300 samples from the most common forms of brain cancer, medulloblastoma and pilocytic astrocytoma. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.